Systems offers gauge management and SPC software and training to help customers demonstrate proof of quality in products and processes. For more information, go to www.pqsystems.com. Welcome to Gauging Quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. I'm Craig Howell, owner of CPM Labs in Rancho Cordova, California. And uh, our sponsor today is PQ Systems. Uh, today's show is going to be a little bit different uh, in a number of ways. If you watched us last week, I'm sorry, last month, uh, you know the show ran 30 minutes. We felt that was a little short. Uh, we're still kind of fine-tuning what this, what this show is going to be like. So this week we're going to run 45 minutes. That should allow more time to get questions in and for us to cover the material that we want to cover. Um, also, feel free to ask questions anytime. If you have any questions, it can be related to what we're talking about today, or it can be related to anything. And actually, we'll get to some questions we got uh, uh, over the past couple of days. We'll get to those in a few minutes. Ask questions anytime. You're just going to send questions to techno-live at qualitydigest.com, and we will try to get to all of your questions anytime during the show. Um, so today's a little bit different. We're going to be talking about, oh, actually, let, let's get started. We, we, I'm sorry. I'll get to you in just a minute. All right. Hang on, Craig. I'll, I'll, yeah, <laughs> this is our expert. Um, we did get a couple questions during the week, and I want to handle those uh, right now if we, if we can, if we can get up uh, uh, those questions up on the screen here. Um, actually, this is one I can answer, Craig. Um, uh, the question is, we have to measure the length of columns used in large power stations. What is the best method of measurement to an accuracy of three millimeters over a length of uh, 19 meters, which 19 would be about meters. 60 feet? the specified length of the fabricated structure. And I would say probably uh, because we deal with this a lot, um, you're going to need some form of large volume metrology. And there's, there's several ways to do this. There's uh, 3D scanners, uh, Ferro makes them, uh, what do they call it, the, uh, uh, the, the Ferro Focus, uh, the Focus 3D, uh, Leica makes them, Leica's part of Hexagon, uh, Regal. Uh, R-I-E-G-L-E -E, makes a laser scanner, uh, Surfaser, S-U-R-P-H-A-S-E-R. -E These are all laser scanners. Essentially, they're put in a room. They can scan an entire room. Within 60 feet, I believe they have an accuracy of better than three millimeters. And, you know, there's just kind of the old-fashioned method, too, of a theodolite or a total station. That would do the same thing for you. I'm assuming we're talking columns that are tall and not laid out on the floor. If they're laid out on the floor, then, then obviously uh, you might want something like a, uh, um, uh, a laser scanner or something like that. Uh, so there's a number. The easiest thing for you to do is, if you're interested in any of those, go onto Google and Google large volume metrology or laser scanner or laser radar. All of those will find you solutions. Oh, actually, another solution is photogrammetry. Uh, Geodetic Systems uh, makes a great photogrammetry system for really large structures. It would be ideal for what you're doing, too. So all of those would be uh, applicable to, uh, to what you're doing there. I believe we had another question as well. This one we're actually going to throw to our viewers. Pay attention to what this guy is asking. He has a unique problem. Um, we measure a piece of pipe whose length is 456 inches, that's about 35 feet or so, for which the tolerance is 0 0.06 inches or about a sixteenth of an inch. We have tried various tools, including a laser tape that was affected dramatically by straightness. We've measured on top of the pipe and inside the pipe with more than with more than one tape measure, one graduated in sixteenth of an inch at that length, and one which was not graduated, requiring the appraiser to interpolate. And one of the problems, and I had this uh, an email back and forth with this guy, maybe you guys have a solution out there. The problem is the pipe is not straight. It's got, uh, it's got some sags in it. It's, it's off in, in two different directions. So a laser tape doesn't work because they put the laser tape down on one end of the pipe, you know, half an inch off the top of the pipe, and 35 feet away, the laser is way off in who knows where, and it's hard to get an accurate reading that way. And a tape measure is only graduated at 1 16th of an inch, which is what they're One trying resolution. to measure out. Yeah. So that doesn't work. Uh, so if you guys any, got any great ideas, send your solutions to techno-live at qualitydigest.com, and we will send them on to this, uh, to this viewer, and also uh, we'll put your answer on the show if you've got a great idea on how to measure a long, not so quite straight pipe to a sixteenth of an inch. Okay, so today we're not really going to talk about gauges per se. We're going to talk about something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about the value of the calibration history, how that can help you with your decision-making process, how you can establish the intervals, uh, the true measurement of a value over time as it will change, it can change. 
some of the features and accessories that we have here that will show how it all coordinates, how you can take software and hardware, get it all into one place to assist in your calibration. Uh, then we'll do a little hands-on demo with some where we can show where cost savings can come into play or where there can be a false cost saving, buying a cheaper tool to save money up front, just how, how that can work. And all of this is stuff that we're going to be able to see actually just by looking at the history, at the history. Uh, of a particular gauge, or in our case, we're going to look at a, at a few different gauges here. True. We'll be looking at some, uh, some analysis, some wear analysis. There, there are all kinds of reports that are available. Now, in, in your experience, do people make use of gauging history much? I mean, do you get, rec you, you run a service, uh, obviously, mm -hmm. CPM Labs is a, is a calibration lab. Um, do you get people requesting this very often, or do you know if people look at their gauging history very often? We do get requests. We get a lot of requests when something fails, when they have a major problem, more of a failure analysis, that sort of thing. Actually, it would be smarter to do it as a preventative, to do it up front. It would be simpler to do it if, the, if all the data was at your fingertips rather than doing it manually the old-fashioned way. And so we'll show you some of that. Let me touch on this a little bit. So um, the old-fashioned way, and I think we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit, was simply paper and pen and, paper or and maybe pen. an Excel spreadsheet and kind of manually taking your data historically from what, your, your, your certs? Typically, we would take them from the data we've collected over the years on the tool and analyze it. If it's just one feature, that's a lot simpler than if it's multiple features. A tool that, that measures multiple different areas might drift different ways, okay. depending. So what we're, what we're going to look at today is how to use, or some of the uh, tools that are available to you using software solutions. Uh, uh, sometimes they're called uh, gauge calibration software, gauge management software, gauge tracking software software. There's a lot of different names they go by. What we're going to be looking at today is a product called Gauge Pack. Uh, we're going to use this to actually examine some, um, uh, some gauge calibration histories. Uh, this is Gauge Pack from PQ Systems, and this does have some uh, useful tools for looking at history. So let's step through some of the things you said that we could actually glean from, uh, uh, from a history. All right. The first thing we'll look at is the performance of a tool over time. The history is going to show its wear. It'll show how often adjustment was needed how stable the tool is, how linear the tool is, how does it track along its, its paces. All this, all this information is available. You already have it in the history as you've typed it in, as you've kept your records. This is a quick way of getting to it. It really, it's so much easier when you can see a graph already made, and like we said in the older days, we had to do it all manually. Uh, I'll give you an example. I can show on a screenshot, just with the click of a button, how we can, we can look at a gauge. We're going to look at a cylindrical plug gauge at this point. We're going to look at this one, which is a one-inch cylindrical plug gauge, and you can just see over time how the gauge has performed from when it was brand new, it was at the top of its tolerance, and how as it wears, as you insert the plug gauge over and over into a hole, how it wears. This is a good visual indication of history, of calibration history. Okay, so we would expect that at some that at some point, uh, probably this this gauge is going to go out of tolerance. I mean, all it can do is wear more, it and you can't adjust it. It only goes one direction. Okay, right. and and that's a good point. There is no adjustment. A lot of these tools do have adjustments, so they will have different graphs for before adjustment and after adjustment. But in that situation, we're going to talk about one that goes one direction, has one function, and does not have any adjustments. So if you, were, if you were looking at this, if you were just somebody who came in new, you, let's say you're new to the calibration lab, and you got, this, uh, you got this gauge pin, and you measured it, and you saw, oh, it's a little on the low side, but it passes, so that would be the last you would think of it. But if you actually had seen the trend, you, you would go, geez, this is going down pretty steep. If it continues this trend, uh, boy, by next year, this, this gauge plug may be... It could very well be out. It may be out, okay. And a lot of the software, gauge pack in particular, shows they have something called a wear trend analysis. We'll get to later, but okay. they actually will estimate, based on previous history, if it's used the same way it has been, you can see when it'll go out. And something as simple as a, as a plug gauge that you might be using, you could have it replaced and ready to go before there's an issue, not after you've measured a pallet full of parts with a bad gauge. Yeah, or, or even it gets sent to calibration, they tell you, oh, this is, this is no longer useful, but you need it the next day, and now you've you got to go order one. it, and you don't have it. Okay, right. A okay. lot of the software cuts down on the confusion. It, it 
makes it so much more predictable. There's not the chaos you normally are involved with. Okay. So that's some of the, on the history, the performance of the gauge. You can see a graph. You can, you can make your decisions and your choices based on that. And again, it's easier to do if it's already there. If it's something you have to compile, you might not have time in the day to do it. If you can click a button and see a graph, you will tend to do it. Okay, so, uh, so performance over time is, is something that you can see with a, a, a calibration history. Uh, what else? Right. Well, there's a number of factors there. You can, you can use a lot of these reports to do such as gauge R&R studies. You can do wear analysis, as we said. You can do stability. What, what, what about uh, uh, interval and knowing, uh, being able to see whether you're on the right interval or not? That's a good point. We get to ask, ask that quite a bit. What's the proper interval? Usually, the basis of the question is financial. It, it's less expensive if they calibrate it every three years rather than every year. Well, you can use the history to see if, ex if lengthening the interval is appropriate. Because the idea of what's the proper interval, the proper interval is to keep the gauge out there in use as long as practical, where it's still, still measuring intolerance. That's a key item. So you get your value out of the, the investment you made in calibration costs. But to recall it before there's a problem. If you recall it after a problem, the interval is too long. You, you've missed. You've missed so, so, so it is okay. It is okay in a certain, certain senses to go beyond, let's say, the manufacturer's re recommended calibration interval if, if, you're, if it's not being used as often or, or, or it just again, doesn't seem to be wearing much. There, the history will give you that answer. The manufacturer can't know how often you'll use a gauge. They may figure it's used twice, three times a week. You might not use it more than once a month. You might be using it 24 hours, 24 seven, then the gauge is gonna wear faster. The history is going to show that. You're gonna be able to see that. So you wanna keep it out there as long as you can, but recall it before it goes out of tolerance. If you do extend the interval, which is asked quite often, if there is a problem, the question is what happens? Well, the last time it was calibrated is the only time you know it was intolerance. It's more of a gamble. How much can you afford, how much product can you check with it and afford to be out? If you're only checking things once uh, every six months, it's not nearly the same gamble as if you're running it three shifts a day. Okay. And just a reminder, if you guys got any questions about what we're talking about right now or questions on gauging in general, this is supposed to be a show for you. Craig and I can pick topics, but really, you guys need to steer it. So um, if you've got any questions, send them to techno-live at qualitydigest.com, and uh, we'll get them on the show. Um, Okay, so we talked about uh, performance over time, uh, choosing the, uh, the proper interval, mm -hmm. engaging history can help right. you with that. Uh, what else can it help you with? Well, another issue might be the true measurement of, of an item over time. Let's, let's take a gauge block as an example. It's going to change over time, and the true measurement really is what it measures today, but the calibration history is important. You can see a gauge block that wears maybe, maybe one or two millionths a year. And you, you can see the trend over history. All of a sudden, it, it's worn 10 millionths. That'd be an indication something has changed. There's something wrong. You wouldn't know it if you have no history. You'd say, well, this gauge is just 10 millionths on the, on the minus side. But ha if you had a history, you could look at it, again, with a click of a button. You could see how it's trending, and then all of a sudden, it just drops off. You'd know further investigation. You might. It might be used in a ceramic environment, which is a braiding. Or maybe somebody dropped it. Or they dropped it and didn't mention that. Okay. So. So, so looking at, so again, this would be one of those cases where a gauge would come in, it might calibrate just fine, and you could bring it back in, but maybe it took more calibration or more work than it did in the past. If you would looked at the history, you would see that see, it would just seem to... It wasn't following. It wasn't following, okay. Right. And that... That's because gauges, gauges should typically, unless they're damaged, they should wear at a... An, a almost fairly a known rate. A known rate, okay. As long as they're used the same. And that's the key. You'd know something was different. Something okay. has changed. Uh, another example of the actual value of a gauge or the actual measurement might be a, a thermometer. Let's take a liquid and glass thermometer. It's a tall piece of glass with a very thin capillary. As that capillary ages, it widens a little bit. The, it's very thin, so the, the mercury, the fluid will drop dramatically. You would know if it's always been very stable. It's always stayed the same. All of a sudden, it's dropped 
a degree or two, something has changed. It's more of an indication of what's changed. It, it still measures what it measures that day. Okay. But this, this will help you in your decision processes. What's, what's gone wrong? Okay. So that would be the actual measurement over time. Um, another example might be a torque wrench. It has multiple features, and the, the features wear at different rates. A torque wrench is a spring-loaded device, and I can give you a screen example of, okay. of a torque wrench we have charted over time and what, what we found on this. Let's pull that up. And while Craig's doing that, just remember, tech, any questions, techno-live at qualitydigest.com. That's T-E-C-H-N-O-live at qualitydigest.com. Now here we've done a wear trend analysis. When we check a torque wrench, I'll show you up at the top, we check it at different, different places. We check it at 15 foot-pounds, which is a low reading. 30 foot-pounds would be the nominal perfect. 45, we'll check it at five different areas, each direction, clockwise and counterclockwise. And what we're looking at down here is the actual performance over years of a 15 foot-pound torque wrench. It was measuring a little low, went a little lower, continued the trend, but not quite at the same pace. Well, the software saves us all the time of manually computing. When is this thing going to go out of tolerance if we don't adjust it? And the software itself has a predicted failure time if everything stays the same. That is great for planning. You'll know then not to leave that tool out there. That would go 100% against extending the interval. That would say the other way around. It's going to fail. And this is based on the previous, uh, we're only seeing three readings here, but this is actually based on, I believe, what, the previous, the previous, history. previous ten, ten readings, I believe. It, it, it's ideal is ten, ten cycles, I have found, with okay. this program. Very useful. Very handy to have that. Now, let's, let's, let's talk about torque wrenches just, just briefly. Is this a good place to, to, to do that, talk about torque wrenches yes, a little bit? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, there was something that you were telling me before that I, I wasn't really aware of is one of the common ways a torque wrench is not used properly is it's set to whatever torque you need, let's say in this case 15 foot-pounds, and it's used, and then maybe that's, that's the only setting they ever use it on, so they use it every day. And when it's put away in the evening or at the end of a shift, mm -hmm. it's left in its uh, Setting. It's left right. in the setting. It's not, it's not backed off, and that's a problem. That's a big problem, and, and that's actually, you'll find it in all the torque wrench manuals. You'll find it in all the specifications. They're made to be backed off because it's a spring-loaded device, and as you've compressed it and you leave it set, that spring's going to tend to fatigue. Even though you're using it at the same interval, it's slowly going to get weaker and weaker over time. And that was kind of what our chart did show us, was it was, it was weakening over time. Right. The proper way would be to, to unwind it all the way before, before you put it away. And I think you were telling me that, that a torque wrench only has so much adjustability to it because you, 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 when you adjust it, you're adjust, adjusting all the ranges simultaneously. I mean, basically, right. you're, you're tightening or loosening the spring, but that's going to affect every reading from from the lowest to the, to the highest to some extent, right? You're right, that, that's true. I'd like to go back to the screenshot again, and what I will show, this is a history, and this is happening, happening to show us the 15 foot-pound range. Well, this software, you can not only look at the 15, you can go to the next step, and now we're looking at the 30, and you can see it's tracking very linear. Okay. Then, then the 45, and again, it's linear. So we're looking at each calibration step, essentially. Each step over the years, so you can see it's not drifting at all on these higher ones, just strictly at the 15. So an adjustment, like you said, is going to affect them all. So if you adjusted to bring the 15 into tolerance... You're going to raise everything else. Okay. Which, if you, I think, and I think you're going to talk about this later, uh, you could still issue a limited cert. If it was only being used for 15, and if you adjusted it and it brought the 15 in, but put right. the others out, it then would still would, be usable, but you would just have to say you can only use it at 15 foot pounds. We would right? state, state the limitation where okay. we would say uh, calibrate at 450 or use at 15 foot pounds because okay. the other ones you'd really have to check to see have they gone out. Gotcha. So that, that is another way that the software will help you see the history. You wouldn't know that if you just got a calibration cert and said as arrived intolerance, as left intolerance with no history, you'd not have a clue that there was an issue. A potential issue coming up. Okay. All right. So uh, performance over time, uh, choosing the proper interval, uh, true measurement value over time, now and the true uh, measurement value. I've got to bring something up okay. here. When we look at the history, 
you don't want to go into a new situation biased by that history. Sometimes you will, you'll, you'll review a history, you'll see a trend, you'll see a trend. When you go in, you're expecting it to continue the same way it was. And I'll give you an example. I was calibrating a scale for a medical device company, and every time for the past five years I've calibrated it at the very high end capacity, let's say it's a 300 gram scale, at 300 grams the display would show an overload like you've done something wrong. It was linear all the way up, we could check it at 280 grams, 290 grams, everything was fine, at 300 it blank out. So we actually had a limited calibration, do not use over, I forget where the limitation we put on it was, 280 pound, or 280 grams, something of that nature. I went in to the situation biased. I was positive it was going to blank because out. It, because it always had, yeah. Always has, wouldn't blank out to save my life. I put the 300 grams on, it went perfect. I tried 301, it went perfect. I went from below going up. You've gotta be cautious. What I had, what I was faced with then was the choice of, well, what do you do now? It looks like it's good, but I know from the history, which is very valuable, that it can blank out. What we did is gave it a full up accept because it was acceptable at that point in time. That's all you really have. But with the history, I was able to put a note on there that says historically this has shown that the gauge can blank out at the higher ranges if that happens, further investigations needed. Okay. If I had gone in cold, if I didn't know the scale and just saw limitation, don't use above a certain range and I tried that, I would think the other lab had done something wrong when really that is just the situation. Okay. All right. So, so in that case, uh, and also leaving that note, if another person was to come along, uh, if they were to change calibration labs, I know they would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> then, then the next person to calibrate that gauge would see your note, and that would also be kind of a heads up for them. Yes. So even if they hadn't, if they hadn't looked at the history, at least there would be a note on that last cert that would say, uh, give them a, a clue that historically there was a problem with that. Right, and that the, gauge. Cust okay. the customer could have that knowledge if they had the proper software they'd be equipped to, to make better decisions, okay. more informed decisions. All right. So that was a, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's no, no, a that's great fine. feature that you, or something to consider is you don't want to go in too biased. You, you, I like to have the information, but I can't expect it to do a certain thing. Right. Now, um, I think we've, we've, we've hit on the high points of what we can get from calibration history. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we, we talked about, well, okay, so we talked about doing this in software. Right. Tell us, I mean, kind of in the old days, you know, a couple years ago, yeah. um, how, would you have, how would you have gotten a calibration history? What, what, what would have been like the manual method for doing this? The manual method would be usually printing out the certifications, looking at the history, making a graph on a graph paper or on Excel, something like that, connecting the lines. What the software does is keep you from from typos, it helps you if you tend to transpose numbers, a lot of times they can get flip-flopped, uh, skipping steps. The old method of review was very time consuming, which cost the customer quite a bit. It had to be done with the data in front of you. Now the data is already in the computer, it's okay. already there. This just saves time, prevents... Make, makes it easier to do, which means probably more likely they're going to they're do it. You're more likely to look at the history. Okay. Uh, some other things I think we're going to talk about with that you can do with um, a, a gauge management or a gauge calibration software is uh, actually makes actually doing your calibrations a, a little bit less tedious, right? That's true. Let, let's take a typical scenario and we'll show just how this integrates in, into real life. Okay. We're a large shop, we have a lot of micrometers out on the floor, and we need to calibrate one of them. We know which micrometer is due, it came up on our to-do list, which is software driven. I called the new tool runner, Dirk, can you go out and find me the micrometer? Here's the number, it's 28-9999, and he says, well, I understand micrometers, I've seen them, but what does this particular one, we've got too many micrometers out, what does it look like? Well, I go to our handy software, and what I can do is go to a screen here, if I choose the, the micrometer, and I can go to a catalog, which is going to show that exact tool, and Dirk now sees it, Dirk the new tool runner, and says, I've seen, I know right where that is. Right. It's a visual aid to get you there. You can assign different pictures for the different, I've assigned them for gauge blocks, for a gauge pin, 
uh, torque, torque range, range down there. We just have a number of them. So it's just an easy way, uh, e easy way, this is your, all of the tools that you've entered into your software, you can include a picture with them so you know exactly what you're talking about. So okay. that went really well. So okay, Dirk comes back with that, and now we're going to end up doing a split screen because I'm going to show you how you can use the barcoding features and just how you can automate a lot of these tasks and really save time and improve your accuracy. Okay. Dirk's come back with the tool, he has the, the micrometer, and we're going to use a barcode scanner. And first we're going to tell the software that we're going to do a barcode event here. I should say that this software allows you to input in a couple different ways. You can input manually uh, by typing into the software, or you can scan commands and a lot of other things actually using a barcode scanner, which is what, uh, what Craig's going to do right now. Right, so I've told him we're going to do a, a barcode event. So what we're going to do is use, they provide a cheat sheet and we're going to tell it we're going to be doing a calibration event. So I scan that and the screen tells me, okay, calibrate the gauge, either scan the gauge or press OK if you're going to enter it manually. We just happen to have a barcode on this gauge. So we're going to scan the gauge and it takes us right to the calibration screen. Okay. Now this calibration screen, we've got to stop here because there's, there's a lot available on this screen. One of the handy options that they have, besides this barcode scanner that PQ Systems offers, is this little device here. It's a temperature, humidity, USB module called a THUM, T-H-U-M. Has a little temperature and humidity measuring cell. And what it does on the screen, it shows us the temperature and the humidity at the time of calibration. They input it automatically. So this, when, I, when this screen opened up, as soon as we entered calibration mode, it took a reading it from here. Reading. So right at that instant, we know what the temperature and humidity is. That's right. right. We okay. don't have, in the old days, we'd have to hover our mouse over it, click, type it in, hope we don't make any typos. Go to the end of your lab, read your, your, uh, your temperature and your, your humidity, come back, type it in. This is one of those time-saving devices that we in the metrology world love. So the telephone rang, you got called away, and I'm going to cover the sensor so we're going to make it get hotter and more humid. The storm just blew in. So you opened this up, you were going to do a calibration. I got called away. But you got called away, or maybe it was time for lunch, and you just left this screen open. Right here on the calibration screen is a, an update where it'll update the temperature. It went up to 81 degrees, and it's almost raining. It got 66 percent humidity. Okay. So that's great. Now also on this screen it has features such as cost. So you can look at your cost because there's there's a lot involved in, in costs and cost savings, true cost savings. You can also look at the time it took to calibrate the tool and you can see did you have to spend extra amounts of time for that less expensive tool, things of that nature. Okay, so you can track your, your cost and, and time spent on the tool, and you can track, uh, I believe you can chart that over time as, uh, as well. You can, okay. but right now with this hands-on demo, we're going to go to the actual calibration screen to where we have a number of different checkpoints listed. We're going to check today, just for this demo, lead air. We check it all the way closed, a little bit open, a little further, all the way from zero to full span. And right away, we're going to click in the box, and we have our micrometer has a data output and a, a USB cord that plugs into the computer. The software senses it. Right. This is a this is a mitotorial gauge with a digimatic output and also has a a. a a Digimatic to USB uh, adapter on it. Most most new gauges now uh, do come with uh, some sort of uh, digital output. Some of them are direct to USB. Some of them are uh, proprietary, like a uh, Silvac or or uh, 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 Digimatic or whatever, and need to be adapted. But most companies are making adapter cables for them now, so it allows you to bring it right into the software. True, and this has a little button here. When I push the button, it's going to take the reading and plug it right into the software. So our first, first measurement was done with, with the gauge closed, and we're going to immediately push the button. It immediately inserts it right into the software. It shows the reading. It compares it with the known tolerance that's already been established. It issues a pass for that feature. It passed it, and it automatically jumped to the next, the next checkpoint. Right. So basically this is saving you from setting down your micrometer, entering the data in manually, then coming back and picking your micrometer up again. You can just sit there and keep the micrometer in your hand, keep taking measurements, and just, uh, just keep collecting uh, data as you go. I'll show you how simple it is. I do my next test point, push the button, 
automatically inputs it in. It was linear. That, that measured 205 on the money, exactly as you'd want. Shows pass and cycles to the next event. Mm -hmm. Now this gauge has been used quite a bit. We, we love this micrometer. It's one of our one of ours that we really like. Well, we noticed around the half inch range and higher, it's starting to wear. And you'll see this on this event. Now instead of 410, it's 40995. It's still well within tolerance. It's allowed us out a tenth. It's only running 50 millionths, but it is wearing. It's showing some wear, and that would show up on those stability trends, linearity trends, uh, wear analysis. It shows up on all the different charts. Now up at 615, our checkpoint, it actually measures a tenth low. It measures 6149. It's still intolerance, but you can really see the wear. And this is a good example for our viewers to know when you use the tool at the same place over and over and over, it will wear. It may not wear much, and some will say, well, that's not a lot of wear, but that's the tolerance of the gauge. And that's because this is being used the same, at the same range all the time. Right, okay. repeatedly for a certain type of measurement. And what happens? The lead screw or whatever starts to wear? Or what, it's what? a number of factors. Okay. Sometimes the face is wear. That would show up in the flatness or the parallel. Sometimes the lead screw. Okay. Again, at, at 820, it was, it was still worn to the tolerance, but still in. And uh, just while you're measuring that one, um, just remember, uh, we're getting close to the end of our show, about another uh, 10, 12 minutes here. So if you've got any questions, get them in so we can get them on the show. Uh, send them to techno-live at qualitydigest.com. Okay, I just finished up in the final reading. Everything was good. This shows it passed. But let, let's say that this particular micrometer had a chip in the anvil. And when we went to check it at the high point, it read quite a bit low. Well, it flags this immediately. This result, I purposely turned it down to 999. It's a full thousandth under. It flags this. The result is be allow below the allowable minimum. When you click OK, watch what's going to happen down here where the previous data it showed it was passed. It shows now that it's failed. It's failed a calibration. Now the last thing we have to do on this screen is determine is this tool overall passed or overall failed? You might say, well, it failed. How could it, how could it possibly be a pass? A good example might be a multimeter, because a multimeter has several ranges. Maybe the range that failed, they don't use. But that's not our case here. So we're going to say it failed. When we click OK, immediately this jumps us to a screen I really like, the corrective action required screen. All the ISO specs talk about that. They all show it. It's all required. So you've got to fill out, you, now you have to fill out a little form about, uh, so this gauge failed, so what are you going to do about you've it? You've always or, okay. had to, but this one guides you to doing the right thing. Ask you, was shippable product affected? The answer in this case is yes. And we're going to say three parts, three parts were scrapped because of this failure. Okay, the corrective action taken, we removed the defective parts. We replace the gauge. And in keeping with true corrective action, we reviewed our training with the inspector involved to make sure they're using the tool right. Now, if we could bring it back into tolerance, we'd be done. But if the gauge would not calibrate correctly, then we would act, that's the point we would have to re replace the gauge. And okay, so now that you have done that, we show the overall tool was it failed, and you click OK. And what happens is we, at that point, we would tag it and we would pull it out of the, of the system. Okay. You'd be surprised a lot of times how often the tags tend to disappear, the tool reappears. I'm sure our viewers are familiar with the tools, reject tools reappearing on the floor. Yeah, out of cal tools or yeah. Out of cal. Well, yeah, okay. as soon as you back on the screenshot, as soon as you try to check out a gauge that has a reject, try to check that gauge out here to put it into use, it immediately shows a warning. This gauge has failed its last calibration. You know something is happening. So you can't check it out. Okay. And further, it won't let you. It says you cannot check out this gauge because it failed its last calibration. So just kind of a foolproof way of, of making sure that uh, out of cal gauges uh, don't or uh, don't don't end up on the floor. Those out of tolerance warnings are really handy. The yeah. corrective action. 
Also, this particular software, which has a feature I really love, it'll do an email notification. You can set it up to where a, a failed calibration event is going to email the production manager on the floor so he knows, oh, that, that tool was used after that shift on another pallet, they could they could review and see right. if, if there's an issue or if there isn't. Okay. Hey, hey Christopher, do we have any uh, do we have any questions? Oh, uh, we do. Have, we we had a question um, that we asked earlier. Somebody was having problems measuring a 35 foot pipe to 1 16th of an inch, and uh, somebody has an answer for them. Uh, this viewer responds. Uh, rather than going to the time and expense of scanning or laser tracking, and yes, that would be expensive, in both cases, I would set up a two-point baseline and take measurements at both ends with a one-millimeter total station. And he suggests a, a Trimble S8 or Leica or Topcon equivalent. Um, yeah, definitely a total station would be, would be a solution uh, if you had one. Those are not necessarily inexpensive uh, pieces of equipment as opposed to a laser tape or a... Uh, or a maybe a more graduated, if they exist, I'm not even sure if you can get a hundred foot tape in 30 seconds or 60 fourths of an inch. <laughs> um, but d yeah, definitely a total station would would do the trick. Um, still looking for a for a low cost solution. So you guys think about that. Is there aside from going to something like a total station or a theodolite, uh, is uh, or total station I should say, is there is there a way to do that? Uh, thanks for that answer, um, Chris. I think you, you said there was also a, a, another question that came in just before the show. Oh, nope, I guess not. Okay. okay. So um, we're running out of time here, so get your questions in. Any further questions, uh, send them to techno-live at qualitydigest.com. There was another thing that we were going to talk about. Uh, was it stability? I think there was a, there was a graph, right? There is a graph. Uh, they have several different reports. You have to set them up to do that. So I'm not likely going to uh, go to I a don't know diff different if database. Going or? to have that, but let me try a different database and see if it'll show up. They they provide us with some sample databases, which are great for experimenting and trying to figure out how these different functions work. Oh, actually, talk about this. This is the color coding you I were talking about. To, yeah. This this is a to-do list screen, and the vents are color coded. You might have a color coding of red for gauges that are overdue for calibration, that are blue for R and R studies. An example might be. The first thing in the day you look and you see and you say, okay, I've got three tools that are overdue. Let's say they were the only ones red. You'd know your first step that morning should be re get those tools off the floor. Get them into calibration. Uh, later on in the day, you're going to want to do the R&R &R studies, which might be with the blue. You set up the colors for what you want the event to represent. This user programmable, okay. Right. But a lot of these, you can, you can look at the actual tool and find out the history on it. And it's very, very handy. You, they have stability studies. I, I actually have to input it in. Okay, all right. So there's, there's, uh, you can do uh, uh, stability studies, uh, gauge, R and R, linearity, uh, linear, and and um, and I think again, pointing out one of the things. This is all stuff that you could do manually, but. It's, it's time consuming, and because it's time consuming, you, not, you may not be as likely to do it as you would um, it, it, it being able to do it at, uh, at, a, touch of the, at a touch of the button. You're yeah. right. I found the software really helps you keep it organized, keep it efficient. It makes it, it's more, you're more likely to do it. Okay. You're just more likely to do it. Now, from a practical sense, I mean, let, let's, let's if, if you were to, Decide. Well, was, you know, software sounds like a, sounds like a great idea. There is a bit of an upfront There's issue, right? Because of all upfront. of your gauges. I mean, pretty much you've got to get all of your gauges input into uh, no matter what software package you use. You need to get your right. gauges. I mean, they do have some import capabilities, but if all you of you've collected is certs, you're basically you have to pull up each cert. You have to input your your gauge information manually input maybe any historical data it, it might be a little a little time consuming there is too. an investment yeah. uh, and it, it's a time consuming investment they've made it quite simple in a lot of these to import uh, the different types of gauge pack the standalone version uses Microsoft Access as its database the enterprise version uses SQL so okay. there are di different ways of, of handling that data and managing it they have made import forms to try to get it from your your old software system, if you had one, right. to the new one as painlessly as they, they can't figure out every scenario, but they have figured out a lot of them. So okay. you're right, there's a time investment up front. Um, 
we still got a little time left, and um, I'm still waiting for some questions. Remember, we've got five minutes. If you've got a question, get it in now. Techno-live at qualitydigest.com. Um, tell me a little bit, just for my own information, how do you measure uh, flatness and uh, uh, parallelism on the anvil in a micrometer. Yeah, just, right. just kind of briefly. Just flatness, in, interesting flatness we use an optical flat and a monochromatic light source. We put it on, flatness is a single surface measurement, so we're going to put it right on the anvil and read the light bands that will show up under the optical flat, okay. the monochromatic light. We'll do that on both the anvil and then the other end of the spindle. Then we'll use an optical parallel, which uses that same principle of light bands they're extremely parallel and will close it down until it contacts both anvil and spindle. And now, instead of counting the curvature of the light bands to see the flatness, we'll count the total amount shown on the anvil, say it's two, okay. and the spindle has three. So you subtract them, you get a difference of one, and one light band rounds off to 12 million. So it's 11.99. It, it rounds off to 12 million. So you would know the parallelism. And why would, why would an anvil lose its flatness or, or parallelism? Where, where in use, a great example would be anyone who measures anything ceramic. It wears them, and if you're using it just on the tip, you can't really get into the full feature, you can oh, just you nick the edge, you're going to wear the edges. Yeah. And that won't show up just using one optical parallel. It may not show up, it may happen to, to be off parallel just in the perfect storm, well, the second parallel is opened up some, it's going to put it in a different orientation. That's where you have to use the two and it shows up. Okay. Uh, Christopher, did we have another question? Okay, great. We have another question. We're just getting the slide ready for it. Um, so, uh, yeah, keep in mind, uh, we still have time after this question, probably for one more, uh, techno-live at qualitydigest.com. Um, just pop that question up as soon as you, uh, as soon as you, you get it. You know, there's there. another thing to talk about. Oh, oh okay, here we go. We got it. Uh, is calibration triggered by the stability X-bar chart of bias? It's not exactly triggered by. That, that is part of the answer. Okay. But, but the X-bar, it's useful. That type of history will be useful in, in making your decisions. But it doesn't actually trigger based on that. Uh, usually there will be an interval it'll trigger a calib calibration event. Sometimes there will be an incident. Somebody has dropped it, okay. things of that nature. But that would apply a lot in stability, linearity. It'll show, it'll show okay. up. Okay. Matter of fact, um, we didn't, uh, yeah, we don't have a way to s show it here. I've seen it in other slides, is you can get a, basically a control chart on the gauges that allow you to actually look at your, uh, your, your gauge from a statistical point of view uh, mm -hmm. and, and kind of look at what's going on and see if there's any special, special events. That's very valid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, was there another question, Chris? <laughs> of course. Last minute. <laughs> All right. You guys got to get on the ball quicker. All right. We just, uh, we'll have this question come in in just one second. Okay. Are there parameters that allow for adjustment of the recall period based on the results of calibration? Oh, so for example, lengthens the period for three successful calibrations, no adjustments made. That's a, that's a, a great question. That's a commonly used method. Uh, one of the companies I worked for years ago, if they had four events, you know, a number of events with no adjustments, they would extend it out, say, they used, I think, 25%. They would go from 100% of the interval to 125%. They didn't want to go too much, then do another study and see how it trended. The only problem with extending it out like that is each time it gets longer and longer. When it finally fails, you're going to be way out on the interval. Yeah, there's always, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, coin toss is, is you may at some point extend it out and you've gone over and you don't know it until it comes back in for calibration then you realize that you've, you've, you've been gone out two years too, too long yeah exactly. and the only time you know for sure that gauge was intolerance was the last time it was calibrated right but I would imagine also looking at the calibration history well I guess if there was no calibration required that you would still you're looking at your trend your trend would I'm assuming be basically a straight line it would be if everything was linear okay all right but yes yes a lot of people will do an interval extension and that's a great use of calibration history and that's where this can help you can look and see you've never had to adjust that gauge it's, it's a micrometer standard it's always measured the same amount it's not growing it's not shrinking it's not wearing okay it would be valid to do it based on that it's a great question all right um, any more questions Chris Okay. Well, we are at the end of our time. Uh, 
Thanks, Craig, uh, for another uh, interesting show. I mean, uh, I think it's important to look at the hardware and how the hardware works, and we, that's normally what we do. We get into a gauge. You know, last time we calibrated a surface plate. But I think this is equally important. You're collecting all of this data, and data is really valuable if you this know especially if you have access scene. to yeah. yeah what goes on behind the scenes so thanks for showing us that hopefully uh, you guys learned something if you have any questions go ahead and send them to us and uh, we will either get them on the next show or we will um, answer you offline um, so I'd like to uh, uh, I'd like to thank our I'm sorry I'd like to thank our uh, our sponsor uh, today was PQ Systems for more than 25 years PQ Systems has provided quality control software and training to help people in manufacturing healthcare government and service organizations demonstrate proof of their quality performance visit www.pqsystems.com to see the full range of products and services that PQ Systems offers. Um, well, Craig, once again, thank you for a great show. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, keep your eyes open in the mail. We're trying to do these once a month, so we will see you uh, at the next uh, Gauging Quality. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. So long.